Good morning again. Welcome to lesson two of our Leviticus study. Uh, we're kind of setting some context here before we approach uh, the tabernacle. And uh, I'm glad you're part of this. I, I've heard a lot of people encouraged that uh, we're going to finally find out what this has to do with, with God, with the people of God, with us. So uh, jump in for a little Bible study this morning and, and we'll, we'll get going. Uh, I want you to think about maybe a place that you know fondly and that you've tried to explain to other people. Uh, for me, if uh, I drove with my family up from uh, south of San Francisco up to the city, uh, I might, right before we get into the city, uh, a little ways before, kind of point out to the right, see that kind of empty space over there right next to the water? That's where Candlestick Park used to be. See, it was a baseball stadium and football stadium for many years. And if I just kind of said that, my family might think, great, thanks, Dad, more sports trivia that's really meaningless to us. But if I actually told them some of the history and what happened there, they might be a little bit more intrigued. You see, if I told them back in 1989, the World Series was going to be played there, and right before the game, all of a sudden, the whole ground shook, the stadium shook, the whole Bay Area shook. I even felt it an hour and a half away from there. And in the stadium that was right over there, there were people standing there. I actually had a friend that was standing toward the top, and he had to hold on to a rail as the whole stadium was shaking. It was not just a place where a baseball game was going to happen. It actually became a place where world history was happening. And if I kind of gave them that background, that historical background, they might look a little longer and think, that'd be cool to see. Or it might be interesting to go in there if that stadium was still around. That's kind of how I feel coming to the book of Leviticus. It's a book, as I've said before, we often read Genesis and then we get toward the end of Exodus about kind of how this tabernacle is going to be constructed and we kind of start to tune out. Then we get to Leviticus and we really start to tune out thinking, what in the world is this about? And we kind of think, all right, God, Leviticus. But if we know the history behind it, and even all that happened before Leviticus and what was really going on in the book, then I think that there's more eagerness to jump into it. So that's what I'm hoping that these first couple of videos do, kind of whet our appetite a little bit and kind of try to get us excited about going into the tabernacle, as it were, together in the book of Leviticus. So. I want to do that by taking you through uh, a little bit of the book of Exodus. So last week, just to review, uh, we started talking about Genesis. I told you that Leviticus was the third book in the five books of the Torah. Really, you can think of one big book, the Torah, but <coughs> Leviticus is the third part of that. And so we looked at Genesis and how in Genesis 3, man and woman were expelled from the presence of God. So they started off having communion with God and Genesis 1 and 2, and even in Genesis 3, but then they sinned. The presence of God came back for them, and they hid from the presence of God because of their sin. There was a barrier there. They were then expelled from the Garden of Eden, expelled from the presence of God, if you will. And again, I'm just sweeping over Genesis. But then we get to Genesis 12, where God picks a man, Abram, and he says, from you, I'm going to create a great nation. What God was doing there in Genesis 12 was saying, I'm going to choose a particular people out of all the people in the earth. I'm going to start them with you, and I'm going to be their God. They're going to be my people. I'm going to have a special relationship with this particular group of people. So God also told Abram that it wouldn't be just be that he'd have many children and God would have this great nation. He'd also bring them into a particular location a particular land. We know that to be the promised land where current Jerusalem is, current Israel. And so God promised that to Abram, and we see the, the growth of the people of God throughout the book of Genesis. God's going to move this nation, his people, to this land where he will dwell with them. Abraham knew it, Isaac knew it, Jacob knew it, Joseph knew it, all the patriarchs knew it, and the people coming after him knew God had a special relationship with this people, and he meant for them to be in the promised land. Well, Genesis ends with the people of God, not in the promised land, but in Egypt. 
Now, God brought them to Egypt and actually allowed them to thrive there and grow up to a point where a new pharaoh came in and started enslaving the people of Egypt. So now, all of a sudden, this, this nation of God's people who were special to him, they had grown, they had thrived, they had material wealth to some degree, they had families, they had kind of grown in their population. Now, they need to be redeemed because they're enslaved. And remember, they're not in the land yet that God wanted them to be in. So we come to the book of Exodus. And again, Exodus, the book right before Leviticus, and we learn some things. The people of God are enslaved by Pharaoh. We read that in the opening verses, opening chapter of Exodus. God, Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, is going to redeem his people, Israel, so that they can worship him. It's interesting when God tells Moses and Aaron to go to Pharaoh and to say, let my people go. He says, so that they can go out into the wilderness and worship me. So God's going to redeem a people, free a people, so they would be freed up to worship him. This is what's happening in the opening chapters of Exodus. I'm skipping through plagues and all sorts of things. We're just kind of flying over Exodus in a sense and dropping down at a couple points. Yahweh also is not just going to redeem them from Egypt. He's also going to make himself known to them. And he tells Moses this. He tells the people of God this. It's not just that I'm going to free you from slavery. Oh, that was good. We no longer have to make bricks anymore. There's more to it than that. Yahweh is going to make himself known to this people. Certainly they knew of him in a sense, but they didn't really know him intimately and personally. But God is telling Moses that he's going to make himself known to the people. Now again, think about how significant that is in light of Adam and Eve being expelled from the garden, being kicked out, sent away from the presence of God. Now God is telling his people, I'm going to make myself known to you. This again is grace. Grace is all over the pages of scripture. In Exodus 6, 6 through 8, listen to what it says. <clears throat> Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from Egypt. So, Yahweh is telling the people here, telling them through Moses, he's not just going to redeem them, but they're going to know him. And as we go through the Torah and as we go through these passages, you're going to see a lot in a lot of places, especially in Leviticus, it gives commands and it says, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. And for us, we need to understand what that meant to the covenant people of God back then, the nation of Israel capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That way of spelling Lord in the English Standard Version and other versions, that is speaking to the covenant-keeping God. See, when we see capital L, Lord, and then lowercase o-r-d, that you, you can think of master, boss, and that's appropriate. When you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, think Yahweh. Think covenant-keeping God. Yes, he's certainly Lord and Master, but when he says that, he's promising himself to a people that he's chosen. This is a God that has steadfast love for these people. This is a God who will never let them go. So it's when you see the word Lord spelled that way, you can translate it Yahweh. It's the covenant-keeping name of God. So he's saying, I'm going to bring you out from the bondage to Egypt. You're going to know that I am your covenant-keeping God the sovereign one, God. So that's what he's saying to them. So Israel's going to be brought out. They're going to know this God. He's going to be with them. Yahweh saves the oldest child in Israel by the blood of the lamb that they put over the doorpost in the 10th plague. We see him with that final plague, redeeming the people of Israel. He brings them out. And what does he do? He brings them through the waters of the Red Sea. He swallows up the enemies behind them. And again, even there, I mean, there's so much more to talk through. In a sense, that's bringing the people through a purifying act, through the waters, to a place where they are now his. 
So, again, more to say about that, but we're going to keep flying over. Yahweh brings the nation through the waters, defeats her enemies, and then brings them into the wilderness. All right. So you're, you're an Israeli at this time. You're one of the Israelites at this time. You're maybe 25 years old. You're working. You're kind of caring for your family. You're doing what Israelites do in Egypt. God sends Moses, this one who's going to free you, lead you out, so that you can be Yahweh's people again in, in some sort of free sense, free fashion, no enslavement anymore. You see these ten plagues. Uh, they're fearful. It's scary. God protects you. You hear about the firstborn of Egypt dying. You are told to keep the Passover and to be ready so that you can get out of Egypt. You go out of Egypt. You see the Red Sea open. You literally walk on dry ground through the Red Sea knowing later on that the enemies of God have been swallowed up by that same water that was just next to you in a wall. And then now you're supposed to be worshiping God and enjoying his presence. Well, now you're in the wilderness and you don't have any water. That's where the people of God are in Exodus chapter 17. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to go there. We're going to read a couple of different passages in this study. But look at Exodus 17. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, now again, think of all that you've been through. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? So here's a problem here. They're frustrated. This was supposed to be better than this. They quarrel against the leader, and Moses says that they, their issue is with God. Why are you testing the Lord? Why are you putting God to the test? Why are you questioning him? Verse 3, But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. <clears throat> so you see the people of God frustrated, angry, grumbling. Evidently, they think when you're a follower of Yahweh, everything should always work out perfectly. What does God say? Verse 5. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile. And go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Now this is so key in our understanding of Leviticus. Listen to what the people say. Is the Lord among us or not? You see what the people are doing here? They're questioning Yahweh, their covenant-keeping God, who freed them from enslavement, brought them to be his people, and as soon as they get their first trial, they wonder, is God even here? Is God, is the covenant-keeping, promising, faithful God even here? Well, what's Leviticus all about? the presence of God graciously dwelling with his people. So you could say, who are these people to question the faithfulness of God? Yet, they're doing it. And can't we do this sometimes? We get into a trial and we wonder, does God even care? Is he even present? Does he even see all the wrongs and suffering that I'm going through? It's important for us not to test the Lord, not to question the Lord, but to remember he is faithful to his people whether it's in the dry seasons or the seasons of flourishing. But this God is questioned here. Is he even among us? That's what they're asking. Yahweh's questioned, Exodus 17, 1 through 7. And then, again, moving forward, we come to Exodus 19, and the people of God are brought to Mount Sinai. And most of what happens from here on out is at Mount Sinai. From Exodus 19 through the end, Exodus chapter 40, the people of God are at Mount Sinai 
God gives them what we know to be the Ten Commandments or the Decalogue. And what he's doing there is saying, you're my people. You're different than Egypt. You're different than the Hittites. You're different than the Amorites. You're my people. And these are the laws that I have for you. And when you see the Ten Commandments, the law of God, you see the character of God. This God is holy. And this is what holy people do. So God is, even in giving these commandments, he's revealing who he is to these people and who he wants them to be. Again, you'll see this. You'll see him say, be holy because I am holy. So God intends when he dwells with his people, they will resemble him. They will mirror him. They will look like him. They will be one with him. That's the intent. So God's making a people holy for himself, setting them apart for himself. That happened in Exodus 20 when he gave them the Ten Commandments. Then Yahweh commands them to build a tent. So it's not just here are the Ten Commandments, but now build a tent. Or in some places it's called the Tent of Meeting or the Tabernacle. Later on in Israel's history, it will become a temple, a, a more fixed structure. But here he calls them to build the Tabernacle. And so much of the rest of Exodus is taking up is taken up talking about the tabernacle now what's the purpose of the tabernacle again think of the presence of God here Exodus 29 verses 44 through 46 I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar Aaron also and his sons so God's saying I will I will make holy I will set apart uh, compared to the other land around it, I will set apart this tent, this tabernacle, and Aaron and his sons, who are the priests, they will be special to me. They will be holy unto me. I will consecrate the, <coughs> the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron and also Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I, this is key, will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know, there's that word again, They'll know me. They'll know that I am the Lord, Yahweh, the covenant-keeping one. They will know that I am the Lord, their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord, their God. Repeat it again. So let me ask this question. Do you think God wants his people to know, listen, I'm coming to have a relationship with you. You will know me intimately. You will know that I keep covenants. I make promises. I keep them. I'm your sovereign one. Of course he wants them to know that. But over and over again, it's special to them, and then they sin and start questioning God. Or it's special to them, and he brings them to a trial, and they question God. But just hear, hear heaven, tell the people of God, I want to make myself known to you. I want you to know me. I want you to dwell with me. This is what we need to understand before we come to the book of Leviticus. So God is making him, himself known. He's showing his people that he's the covenant-keeping God. He's their God. And then, what do we see in the rest of the book? Chapters 25 through 31, instructions for the tabernacle. So God is showing the people, telling the people what he wants to be in this giant tent of meeting. How he wants it to be organized. And again, we'll get to it later on in Leviticus, but a lot of the things that are in the tabernacle have certain, certain reminders of Eden. Remember Eden, the place where God dwelled first with man and woman. Now the tabernacle has some of those elements brought into it. God dwelling with men and women and children, his people. So you see the instructions for the tabernacle come in chapters 25 to 31, and then something happens in chapters 32 to 34. We'll get to that in a moment. But what happens after those happenings in 32 to 34? Well, in 35 to 40, they start building the tabernacle. The construction starts. So there are instructions for the tabernacle, and in God's plan, it's meant to be instructions, now start building. But there are instructions given, the people do something, and then the construction of the tabernacle starts after that. What happens? We need to understand this. The golden calf incident. You may have known about this. Maybe some of you are new to Christianity. You don't really know what this was all about. Maybe some of you have been hearing this story ever since you were little. The people worship 
an image, a God they create up for themselves of a golden calf. They want to see something. They want to see their God. Now, you have to understand why that's so horrible in, in the context of all that we've understood. God was bringing his people out of Egypt so that they would know him. Evidently, they want to know him the way they want to know him, not the way he's going to make himself known to them. So we get the golden calf incident in chapters 32 through 34. Yahweh was making himself known to the nation. We've covered that. Yahweh was about to dwell with them in the tabernacle in the promised land. So think of where they are. They're at Mount Sinai. He's just given them instructions for a tabernacle. He's already told them that he's going to dwell with them in this tabernacle. You'd think that would be enough for them to say, all right, if it takes some time, we'll wait. You're going to be with us in a special way. No, they're impatient. So Yahweh's promising to dwell with them in the tabernacle, in the promised land that they get to. And while Moses goes up to Mount Sinai to receive instruction from the Lord, they can't wait. They want to know God. They want to see God. They, they, want to, they want to see him on their terms, not on his. They don't wait, and so they create an image of a God that they could see. They get all the jewels and things they had had in Egypt. They melt them together. They get Aaron to do this, and he sets up a golden calf, and they begin worshiping this calf, looking just like the rest of the nations, even looking like Egypt that God just saved them from. John Owen actually has a great quote about what they're doing here. Listen to what John Owen says. He says, God had planned to, to give them a glorious representation of who he is. So God had planned, I'm going to make myself known to you in this tabernacle, in this land. You're going to see things. I'm going to make myself known. They can't wait. Listen to what Owen says. But as Moses went into the mountain... The Israelites would not wait for his return, but made a calf in his stead. So mankind, refusing to wait for the actual exhibition of that glorious image of himself, which God had provided, broke in upon his wisdom and sovereignty to make some of their own. So the people of God, just been saved by God, redeemed by God from, from, from Egypt in the Exodus, they can't wait for God's revelation to them, they break in to his wisdom and his sovereignty, kind of creating their own. They create their own wisdom, their own rule. This is how we're going to worship. This is the God we're going to serve. Think of the audacity and the arrogance and the sin there. That's what happened. So now you see why there would be a little bit of a disruption in the plans. How's Yahweh going to respond to this? Well, guys, you really shouldn't have done that. Don't worry about it. No, he takes it seriously. They reject God and his revelation and make a God their own image. I love what Michael Morales says. and It's really graphic language, but he says, basically gives the idea that they played the whore, they committed adultery the night before their wedding day. It's really what they did. Yahweh was going to come and dwell with them. It was so close to happening. And they go, they go after another lover right before the wedding day. That's what's happening in the golden calf incident. What happens after the golden calf incident? Moses rebukes the people. Moses rebukes the people in chapter 32, verse 30. Moses intercedes for the people. Let's actually turn there. Chapter 32, verse 30. The next day Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin, and now I go up to Yahweh. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses tells the people that. He then goes up, back up to Mount Sinai. Only he was allowed to go up to the top to speak with God. Moses intercedes for the people in verses 31 to 32. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, think of Moses speaking on behalf of the people. He just rebuked them, but now he's going to intercede for them. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. 
So God's God's asking Yah or Moses is asking Yahweh to forgive the people, but if he won't, then take me out of your book so that they can go in. You, you see similar things in, in Romans 9. Paul's saying, I want my countrymen to be saved. I want the Israelite nation, the nation of Israel, to know Jesus Christ. Even if I'm damned so that they can know him, I'm willing to do it. You see that 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 love that, that these leaders have for their people. They want them to enjoy salvation. That's what Moses is asking Yahweh. And then, listen to God's response in verses 33 all the way through the next chapter, chapter 33, verse 3. So, starting in 32, 33. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now, go. Lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. So Moses, get out of here. I'm going to go after this people. They're going to be punished for what they did. Verse 35 of chapter 32. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf and the one that Aaron had made. Chapter 33. The Lord said to Moses, depart, go up from here. You and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So listen, Yahweh saying, Moses, get out of here. I'm going to send a plague. And then he says, now get up, pack up your stuff. No more time at Mount Sinai. Go to the promised land. And you might think, okay, we're done here. He he, he sent a plague to punish the people. They still get to go in the promised land. No big deal. Let's keep reading. Again, verse 1. Depart, go up from here, and the people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your offspring, I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I will consume you on the way for you are a stiff-necked people. You hear what's happening here? God was going to be in the promised land, dwelling particularly in the tabernacle, particularly in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, and he was going to be with the people there. And he's saying, because of what you've done in going after false gods, go, go to the promised land, but I'm not going with you because I might consume you on the way because of how sinful you are. So they're going to get the promised land, but not Yahweh's presence. I wonder if Moses is okay with that. Let's keep looking. Moses responds in verse 12 of chapter 33. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you've said, I know you by name. And you have also found favor in my sight. So Moses is reminding Yahweh about about Yahweh's first call in his life. Yahweh first telling him, you're going to bring this people up out of Egypt. I'm going to be with you. So Moses is reminding God of what God had told him back then. Verse 13. Now therefore, Moses says, if I found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways. What are you going to do here? Please show me your ways that I may know you. In order to find favor in your sight. Consider too this nation is your people. So Moses saying to God. You've promised yourself to this people. Don't forget that Yahweh. Consider too that this nation is your people. And he said. My presence will go with you. And I will give you rest. And he said to him. So, So Yahweh says. Okay my presence will go with you. And I'll give you rest. And Moses says to him. If your presence will not go with me. Do not bring us up from here. So Moses is saying, God, you called me to lead this people out. And these people are your people. You promised yourself to them. That's what you promised. So now, go with us. And and God says, Yahweh says, my presence will go with you. So Yahweh is, is having his promises brought before him. And he is the faithful God. He is the covenant-keeping God. And so, yes, he will go before them. And Moses says, If your presence will not go up with me, do not bring us up from here. 
basically saying, I don't want the promised land if you're not going to be there. That's special. <laughs> Moses doesn't just want the blessings from God. He wants God to be with him. Moses doesn't just want the blessings of God on the people of God. He wants God to be with the people of God. And really, that's our view of our life, isn't it? We don't just want the blessings that come from God's hands. We want him. We want to know him intimately. We want to worship him and be, him and be with him. Even heaven is about that. It's not just that we get the blessings of heaven. We want to be in the presence of the God of heaven without any of our sin getting in the way. And this is what Moses wants. Don't send us in there if you're not going to be there. And God, again, being faithful and so gracious, Yahweh says, I will go and be there. That's what happens here. I read these, these verses to you, Exodus 40. 33, 35, this is actually at the end of the book. Let's look at them. At the end of the book, they have built the tabernacle. The, 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 they're, they've finished it. The, the book is ending. Exodus is ending. And it says this. And he erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. The cloud was the visible representation of the presence of God. The cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And right there, you can stop right there and say, wow, in light of the complaining at Meribah, Exodus 17, in light of the golden calf and their adultery the night before their wedding, as it were, Exodus 32 to 34, God still dwells with them like he said he would. This is grace. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. There's a little cliffhanger here. Moses has been going up to Mount Sinai to meet with God, to hear from God. The text says that he goes up to, to talk to God face to face. Moses is the only one allowed to do that. The people can't do that. They'll be consumed if they try to go up that mountain. Not even Aaron can go up at a point. Now, they built the tabernacle, and Moses is not allowed to go in. It reminds me of Psalm 15. O Lord, who may ascend to your holy mountain? There's some distance here, even though God's coming down to dwell with his people. And that's us at the doorstep of the book of Leviticus. That's what's happening here. So we come to Leviticus not saying, oh, come on, this is boring. When we know the history, we realize, whoa, something special is happening. What happens now that the tent's set up? What happens now when the first person tries to walk in? What do we know? What do we learn? What does the Bible tell us? And that's where we're at. A couple keys to understanding this book. Always expect that there is a reason the Holy Spirit has given us a portion of Scripture that is difficult to understand. When you come to places that are difficult to understand, why are all these names here? Why are all these numbers here? Why are all these laws here, Leviticus? Why so much blood in Leviticus? Why so many sacrifice, sacrifices? Don't ever question God by sitting over him in judgment and saying, come on, what's important here? Always sit under the Word of God and say, I know, based on who you are, there's a reason this is all here. So, always expect that there's a reason the Spirit has put difficult passages in the Scriptures. And then, ask the Lord to teach. The Holy Spirit actually gives illumination. New Covenant believers have the Holy Spirit inside. So say, Lord, teach me here. Help me learn. Help me understand what you want me to know from your word, this, this Old Covenant book in Leviticus. Next, Dig, dig, dig. Read the passages that come before. Read the things that come after. It takes work. It, gold isn't found by just walking around and seeing gold on the ground. You've got to dig. You've got to mine for it. So dig, dig, dig. When you come to a place where you think, I don't know, I, why is that even there? Find out. It takes time. It takes hard work. It takes prayer. But dig. You'll find the jewels. You'll find the gold. Next, understand the context which is what we've done. So 
Next time you come through a Bible reading plan and you come to Leviticus, remember all that happened before it that has led you there to the doorstep of the tabernacle, if you will. Know what's come before before you enter into that book. So you've got to know the context of any book if you're going to rightly understand it. I don't care if you're studying Leviticus or Colossians or Revelation or John or Jeremiah. You've got to know the context. So we've been doing that. Some takeaways today before we end our time. Being in the presence of God is a privilege. Can you see that? God has promised his presence to his people graciously. We might have thought Adam and Eve ruined it forever, but God graciously has still promised himself to his people. And even then, he's rescued his people. Think about the parallels to our salvation. He rescued Israel from enslavement in Egypt. He's rescued us from the slavery of sin. He, he's no longer, Satan is no longer our father. Now God is our father. He's rescued us. He's redeemed us. He's freed us. We no longer have to sin. We've got a new principle inside of us, a new heart. And he will dwell with us. He's, he's uniting himself to us. Being in the presence of God is a privilege. Next, long for the presence of God without any interruption. Now, it's still not perfect yet. We still have sin that clouds our relationship with our Lord. It doesn't take us away from the Lord. He secured us. We know that's true. But it clouds the relationship we have. We don't like the way we feel when we sin. But go, if you will, to Revelation 21. You could say, in a way, the whole Bible is about the presence of God with his people started that way in the Garden of Eden, the earliest chapters of Scripture, Genesis 1 through 3. Then Revelation 20 at the very end, what is, what is happening at the end? Heaven comes down to earth, Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, because the first heaven and the first earth have passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall be mourning, there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. This is what we're going to. The presence of God is so important in the scriptures. The scriptures are teaching us how wonderful the presence of God is with his people. They had it perfectly in the garden. They will have it perfectly in the future. And right now, people in general don't have that fellowship with God until he saves them. And then they do have the presence of God, but they still have remaining sin. And it's not like we want it to be. So long for the presence of God without any interruption, without any sin. Next, <clears throat> in the meantime, where do we go to find God's presence now? Where is God's presence now? We know that our Lord Jesus himself ascended to heaven, and so we're waiting for heaven. We want to be united back to him. We want to see him face to face, literally see him face to face and be with him and to see him as he is and then to be changed by that, to know him. Again, hear these echoes of God telling the people, you're going to know me. We want to know him more intimately. We certainly know him now. He's made us to know him as born-again believers. But we want even more intimacy, that final intimacy with him. But where is the presence of God now in the meantime? Now, here's an error. You can take the Old Testament and say, okay, the Old Testament always automatically has a mirror in the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, we had a tabernacle. In the New Testament, we have church buildings. So the presence of God was in the tabernacle or the temple, the New Testament church. The presence of God must be in the building. So we better get this church building built fast so the presence of God can dwell with us. That's a wrong way to view the presence of God. Look what 1 Corinthians 3 says. Do you know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you. 
think about how rich that statement is. Do you know that you are God's tabernacle? You are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. See what happens here? God sets up a place, a tent of meeting in, in Leviticus and says, this is what it takes to dwell with me. This is what it takes to be right in my presence. This is what it means to be holy in my presence. And then when Jesus Christ comes, one of the great things about salvation is that the Bible tells us that we are in Christ. We are part of who Christ's life. We enjoy the, the closest communion with him. And this says, he's now ascended to heaven, but Paul writes to the church, you're the temple of God. You're the temple. God is dwelling in you. Now that right there, I think, I think if you're reading this rightly, right there you should think, oh my, what a responsibility. And that's the way we're supposed to think. What a responsibility to be holy. What a responsibility to represent him well, to live like him. What a great responsibility Maybe I should be holy as he is holy. That's why 1 Peter 1 says the same thing that Leviticus tells us. Be holy because I'm holy. But now God's inside of us. By the way, it also has something to do. This also, this also relates to how we treat one another as Christians. Colossians 3. The church in Colossae was filled with Jews and Greeks. Paul had just told the church... Stop being angry with one another. Stop, stop committing sexual sin. You're hurting one another. You can't live like this. That's the old you. The new you is in Christ. So put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Wear him. You're no longer wearing Adam and Eve. You put on Jesus Christ. And notice in Colossians 3.11 it says this. Here in this church, in this gathering, in the place where the Spirit of God dwells, here there is not Greek and Jew circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all, and notice this, this little preposition, and in all. Christ is in all believers. Christ, the presence of Christ dwells in all believers. So think about the tabernacle. He's not dwelling in a location, in a tent or a temple. He's dwelling inside of us. So do we think we should treat one another well? Yes, that's Paul's whole point. Before you were separated, free person and slave. Before you were separated, Greek and Jew. You, you, didn't, you didn't enjoy each other. You didn't trust each other. But now you come together as one new man, each having the spirit in you. Christ is in you. He's in you all. So this, even this study of Leviticus, should, should kind of fast forward us to what God teaches us in the New Testament and say, wow, his presence is inside of us. That should change the way we treat other believers. Now, two lessons in. We're not even yet to chapter one. Next week, the plan is to jump into chapter one. But if you're kind of rolling your eyes at this point thinking, man, two introductory lessons. Can't we just get into Leviticus? Can't we just get into chapter one? Let me ask you this question. Have you ever said that before in your life? <laughs> Have you ever said, come on, open up Leviticus? Well, that's what the context will do. If we just know the context of scripture, then we say, what comes next? What's he going to teach? So next week, Lord willing, we'll get into Leviticus one. The Israelites waited 40 years to get to the promised land. We'll just wait one more week to get into the tabernacle. Hope you're well this week and that you enjoy the presence of God with you.